It is a piece of pale ivory linen with various slightly darker markings. Is it really the image of Jesus Christ moments after his crucifixion, as many believe? Are the stains really his blood? Well-publicized carbon dating tests say no. Rather, that this 14-foot length of cloth is a very clever medieval forgery. But recent information has raised serious doubts about the accuracy of the carbon dating. Scientists are again pressing their attention to the old question. Is this an image of the crucified Jesus? Since the 1400s, the shroud has been taken out of its silver box many times, draped over balconies for royal weddings, and stared at in wonder by countless pilgrims. The shroud first appeared in Europe in 1355. It was well known during the worst years of the Black Death, when huge crowds stood in line to see it, when Gutenberg perfected the printing press, and when Columbus discovered America. In an age short on scientific tools, in which forgeries were commonplace, the question of the shroud's authenticity could not really be resolved. The public generally assumed the shroud was authentic, but the debate between science and religion was just getting underway. In 1898, the church permitted examination of the cloth by the impersonal eye of a rather new invention, the camera. No one could have expected that the photograph Segunda Pia took that day would change forever the way people saw the shroud. For as the photographer's glass plate emerged from the developing solution, he saw a face, a distinct clear face, unlike anything ever seen before on the shroud. He understood at once that the shadowy image on the cloth had been a negative, and that he was now looking at a positive, he held in his hands an image that would launch a century of scientific investigation. A hundred years after that first photograph was taken, the city of Turin prepares for another public display of the cloth. In that time, it has become the most studied artifact in human history. A new high-tech home is being prepared for the shroud. A hermetically sealed case of aluminum and glass from which the air is pumped out and the inert gas argon pumped in. When the shroud is placed in here, it will never be rolled up or casually handled again. All this activity may seem surprising if the carbon dating tests are correct, that the shroud is a fake. Is it blind faith, or is there reason to doubt the scientific findings? The shroud is again the center of controversy. At an unmarked side entrance, restricted access enforced by guards, unseen by the public and documented only by a single camera. A Swiss textile expert carefully stitches it to a new backing cloth, inch by inch. 
For the curator of the shroud, there is no question about who it is this cloth once covered. This image represents a man who died from the torture of crucifixion. On the Shroud of Turin, there are three types of markings. The most obvious marks are scorches from a fire that almost destroyed the Shroud in the Middle Ages. Then there is the anatomically correct image of a man, front view and back. And third, what appear to be bloodstains. The bloodstains match biblical descriptions about the torture and crucifixion of Jesus. The beating, the crown of thorns, the spear wound. But is the blood really blood? And how did the image get onto the cloth in the first place? The persistent mystery surrounding these questions has challenged scientists for generations. Students at this college in Glendale, California, get a special glimpse into the ongoing debate about the shroud. Their professor, Angelo Montante, uses the shroud as a teaching tool. This is one of the most amazing cultural uh, artifacts that we find in the history of Western civilization. Clues can be drawn out of it that gives us a perspective on the past. The Bible does not give us details dealing with the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. But let me call your attention to the spot right here where there was bloodshed. If classical paintings were correct, he should have been nailed through the palm. But he wasn't. He was nailed through the wrist. And there has to be a reason for that. And we know what the reason is because of some research done by a French physician. In Years ago, a French surgeon experimenting with cadavers was able to determine that the palm cannot maintain the weight of a human being. It has to be through the mesocarpal region of the wrist. Something else is important in this regard. When you nail a person in that area, you press on the median nerve. And when you press on that median nerve, the thumb goes in. And if you'll notice, you do not see thumbs on the figure at all. That's a very accurate kind of thing. How could a forger have possibly known that? Here we have another enhanced image of the shroud. This darkened matter represents blood. Here, more blood on the arms. And then the whole torso is bleeding. On the side of the torso, near the fifth rib, is an unusual exudation of blood. It matches the shape of the Roman lancia which was in use at the time of the crucifixion. There is a lot of blood on the shroud, so much so that it makes you wonder at the cruelty of the Romans, that they inflicted such pain on this individual. Cruelty shown on the shroud far exceeds most artistic versions of Christ's passion. Why would a forger have displayed so much more than people expected to see? Short streaks of blood on the back and legs of the man on the shroud baffled researchers for years until it was noticed that they exactly matched the peculiar shape of the first century whip, the flagrum. I'm holding in my hand a replica of a Roman instrument of torture. It's called the flagrum. And at the end of each thong, you find these dumbbells. Notice that there is a space between the two dumbbells. Even modern medicine would probably not have been able to prevent this death. We can determine the severity of the wounds of the man on the shroud because of the anatomical accuracy of the image. An image so accurate, it can be read by a modern physician. This is a quarter size negative of a picture of the shroud. Um, and it appears to be a middle-aged male 
If we assume that blood is going to appear white, there are other things that will appear white as well. But if we as a specialist, Dr. Zalut is used to examining x-rays of acute trauma victims. There's areas of bleeding um, diffuse about the scalp, both in the front and in the back. There's areas in the chest, again in the front and in the back, that uh, look as if there's been bleeding. You can see that there's been an injury to the left wrist. You can't see the right wrist because the left hand covers the right wrist, but there appears to be an area of injury to the left wrist with blood on both forearms. Um, the posterior portion of both legs and the buttocks are covered with blood as well. In both ankles, there appears to have been some bleeding as well. It's impossible to say what the cause of death was, although there's multiple areas of injury, any one of which could have uh, been fatal. The specific wounds are consistent with only one cause of death, crucifixion. In the late 1970s, a group of scientists pressured the church to let them examine the shroud with the latest technology. An agreement was finally reached, and the Shroud of Turin research project, STIRP, was on its way to Italy. STIRP was, a, was put together primarily with the purpose of examining the shroud to determine how the image was formed. But we had the big problem of never being able to see the thing we were to examine until we got there. It was like an expedition into a, an unknown part of the jungle. We brought with us a, a host of technologies. Virtually every type of imaging that we had available to us to determine how the image was formed. I thought that I was going to be able to walk into the room, see the shroud unveiled, walk up to it, look closely, see the brush strokes, and go home. Vern Miller was another of the scientists involved. He also started off with a skeptical attitude. The first time I would heard about the Shroud of Torn was from Barry Schwartz, which I thought was a fairy tale of some type. But Sterp's uh, objective was to find the mechanism that caused the image to appear on a piece of linen cloth and uh, not to authenticate the cloth as the burial wrapping of Christ. So relieved of that responsibility, we could look at it in a much more objective way. I didn't know what the shroud was at the time. I'd never heard of it to my knowledge. STIRP member Don Lin took time off from his regular job as director of JPL's digital imaging program for NASA. At the time, we were working on the Viking program, which was a soft lander on Mars. We basically had one day to set up the equipment, get it unpacked, set up, and calibrate it. And that night, we were supposed to get the shroud around midnight. And of course, about 11 o'clock, a little early, very unusual, the shroud was brought down the hallway into the room. One of the first experiments that was done on the shroud was to separate the cloth from its backing cloth uh, in a small area, about four inches. That allowed us the first look at the backside or the underside of the Shroud of Turin in 400 years, and this image is the precise moment that they took their first peek at the back of the shroud. Then Professor Rigi of the Italian team inserted an endoscopic camera between the two claws. When I saw that focusing light underneath the number three blood stain, I turned off the room lights, he turned on the focusing light, and we saw for the first time that the blood stains had actually soaked into the cloth the way blood would, and the image did not. Right away, a significant discovery. When viewed from the front, both the image and the blood are seen clearly. But when light is shown through the back of the shroud, the blood is visible, but the image is not. That was something we didn't know until that moment, which meant the image could not be a painting, or we would have a density of paint on the shroud that would show in a transmitted light photograph. We were all anxious to find if the blood was real or not. When I first viewed the, the shroud during those tests, uh, 
the blood did not look real to me. The blood looked quite red and fresh, other than something that was supposedly 2,000 years old. To determine if this was real blood, we took samples uh, on a sticky back tape and then examined it in a laboratory much later. It was not until several months later that we determined that this was real blood. Okay, in the next slide, we show the actual blood on, on the, the weave of the cloth. This, uh, is this the blood of Jesus? Is it the blood of another person who happened to have been crucified by the Romans? Is it the blood of an innocent man taken to create an extraordinary hoax? One of the theories of image formation on the shroud was that it might be a scorch because the color is something like the scorched color of an ironing board cover. In normal light, both scorch and image look the same. Since all scorches fluoresce under ultraviolet light, we imaged the shroud using UV photography. We did not see body image. We got wonderful images of all the scorches on the shroud, but the body image didn't show at all proving that the body image could not be a scorch. As to what might have caused the image, the scientists ruled out possibility after possibility. Microanalysis of the threads that were brought back determined that the color change of the threads was due to a chemical change, uh, dehydrated oxidation. Uh, but we do not know what caused that chemical change. The stains on the cloth are remarkably subtle and complex. One fiber will be discolored, while an adjacent one is not. Yet each fiber is only one-tenth the diameter of a human hair. And in some places, the image only penetrates to one five-hundredth of an inch. There is no known way of replicating such markings on a cloth. Most experts are now convinced that the image was not painted. In the search to understand how it was created, scientists placed it under a machine called the VP-8 Image Analyzer, a unique device used by NASA to interpret photographs from space. If we place a perfectly normal young man's picture under the VP-8... Any two-dimensional image, such as a photograph or a painting, will not be read properly. The shape of the original object will appear distorted. The hair, which we know to be over the brow, is actually sunken because it's darker. Whereas the face, the cheeks, are actually elevated because they're lighter. A photograph of the shroud should be distorted as well. But it isn't. When this image was seen for the first time, scientists were amazed. It was perhaps as dramatic a moment as when Segundo Pius saw the negative image of the shroud for the first time. We notice that the nose is above the cheeks and that the face is of the proper dimension. The beard and the hair... The VP-8 analysis was a breakthrough, establishing that the image was formed while the cloth was draped over a three-dimensional object. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition, on Good Friday, to mark the day Jesus died, a woven tapestry is brought out, carried as if being taken from a tomb. This tradition goes back more than a thousand years. Each tapestry is different, yet each one bears the image of Jesus laid out on a burial cloth, the body banked with flowers. The similarity to the shroud is unmistakable. Many say that this tradition of placing flowers around an image of Jesus in his shroud goes back to the very beginnings of the Christian church. In recent years, subtle images of flowers have been discovered on the shroud itself. 
This area of research has been vigorously pursued by Dr. Alan Wanger of Duke University and his wife, Mary. Wanger developed the hypothesis that certain off-body images on the shroud were impressions of flowers. He came to this research from the work of German physicist Oswald Sherman. Um, he noticed these, but I didn't see what he was talking about at first. But later on, I noticed the image of a, a flower very closely resembled a chrysanthemum. And as I backed off and looked around, I began seeing many of these images uh, on the shroud. Obviously, these were banked in around the body at the time of burial. The purpose of the flowers is not known. Perhaps as a fumigant, since the body was hastily buried, or perhaps just to honor the dead. And by studying the shroud very carefully, we feel that we identified actually uh, 28 of these uh, flowers on the shroud. Wanger studied details on the shroud, comparing them with life-size photographs of the corresponding plants they resemble in the field. In addition, we were able to, uh, to uh, determine the uh, flowering time of these, and uh, uh, all of these flowers bloom in either March or April, which, which indicate uh, that this was the, the time of uh, Passover, uh, the time of crucifixion. Many of the plants recognized by the Wangers seem to be native to the Jerusalem area. They showed their findings to Israel's leading botanist, Avinoam Danin. Using details of plant morphology, I was uh, rather happy to confirm their uh, observations. Then uh, I looked more and more, and uh, altogether, I marked here about uh, th uh, 12 or 13 objects, botanical objects, that I observed on the shroud. One of the plants, Zygophyllum dumosum, was the key evidence for botanist Danin. Not only did he see its image on the cloth, but he found even more precise details than had the wangers. Did this plant once lay on the Shroud of Turin? We can see here the image of Zygophyllum dumosum. Uh, the winter leaf looks like that. This is the patio. Zygophyllum dumosum grows in only one place in the world, a small area near Jerusalem. The four leaves I found is so clear that I can state that the stem of Zygophyllum dumosum was laid on the shroud in the spring. Additionally, I could say to you that uh, it couldn't be that the shroud was made somewhere else. It had to be here. If there were flowers around the body, there would also be pollen. Pollen can last thousands of years and under the microscope, each type is distinctive. Clues too small for the naked eye, just waiting for the right detective. In 1973, the Swiss criminologist Max Fry was permitted to take samples of pollen from the weave of the shroud. He preserved them on glass slides. Trained as a botanist, he spent years analyzing their pollen content. He died before he could finish and publish his conclusions, but others have taken up the work. Using state-of-the-art technology, they can exactly identify each pollen grain and match it back to the plant. Uri Baruch is Israel's leading pollen expert. Working with Dr. Denin, he calculates the type and frequency of pollen on Fry's slides. In the back of my mind, that there are also canopods that have the same pollen type. And uh, we haven't met this one before. It's the first instance of this pollen type. The goal is to determine exactly which plants surrounded the body and which were the most prevalent. Of the 58 pollen types identified so far, 28 of the plants exist only in the Middle East. Proof that the cloth spent part of its history there. Many are still part of the lives of the people of the region, like Fagonia mollis. The leaves of Fagonia mollis are used by the Bedouin in southern Sinai to heal superficial wounds. 
uh, they take the green stems and leaves and uh, burn it. Uh, the powdered ash is used uh, to put on the wound. They call it uraga. There is another Gundelia right now, if you know. The slides have revealed an unusually high density of pollen from a plant called Gundelia turniforti. This particular sample came from an area next to the head of the man on the claw. You can see the spines, okay? Here one, here one, here one. And the plant that left so much pollen in this spot on the shroud can be recognized by its flower but it's better known for something else. I have to use my knife because it's a highly spiny plant. This is uh, Gundelia tourneforti, uh, the thistle the, um, uh, that has the highest frequency of pollen grains on the Shroud of Turin. In this Greek Orthodox monastery, deep in the Sinai Desert, is a very special painting of Jesus Christ, known as the Pantocrator. Many researchers are convinced that it was painted while looking at the shroud. It was painted in the sixth century. We see on the icon that the eyes have a very large uh, staring appearance. But if we rotate it to the shroud, we see that the eyes on the shroud have the appearance of being wide and staring and a little off-center. Uh, we notice our Dr. Wanger has perfected a polarized light technique for comparing shroud images with other images, like the Pantocrator. And as I rotate the filter looking at these two images on the screen, uh, one image will fade in, into the other. We do this for exacting uh, comparisons. On the icon, uh, we can uh, notice a, what appears to be a tear trickling down the cheek at this point. But if we rotate the shroud, we we'll actually find that there's a little stain, possibly blood stain, running down the same place. If we drop down to the tip of the nose on the icon and then shift to the shroud, we notice the configuration of the nose is quite exacting. Looking down at the lips on the icon, we see that there are apparently a chapped lips here. But if we uh, look at the detail on the shroud, we notice that uh, all of those marks are visible on the shroud. Jesus was the most illustrated person in history, but the Bible never said what he looked like. How do we know? How do we know he had a beard? How do we know he had long hair? Where did artists get their imagery from? Art historian Jack Riley has made a study of the face of Jesus in painting. Is there a common source for this image we all know so well? Each artist has his own view of the man suffering, triumphant, the redeemer, the humble. Yet artists over the centuries have stayed within certain parameters that allow us to recognize the man as Jesus. What are the guidelines and where did they come from? Riley and many other researchers believe there was a prototype Jesus that set the standard centuries ago. The search for that prototype has taken researchers back to the first centuries following Jesus' death. How would an artist get from this image to this image, where we have the beard, no beard, the hair falling down, parted in the middle on both sides, not here. This, this Jesus looks like a Roman god. 
He's painted in a youthful manner. He doesn't have the same characteristics. The question is, what's missing? In the 1930s, French researcher Paul Vignon noted numerous markings on the paintings that have been done of Jesus Christ for many years. Uh, these came to be known as the Vignon markings. Let's take a look at some of them. First of all, notice this line transversing across the forehead of Christ. And look at this, a geometric three-sided square on the bridge of the nose. Also, another triangle right here on the nose, an elongated nose that is indicative of numerous paintings of Christ uh, from the period. Scholars have identified the owl-like eyes, the elongated nose, and the rest of Vignon's markings on the shroud. Was the shroud the model in the first place? Here we have some reproductions of some 11th and 12th century paintings in which you'll notice these geometric markings. First of all, right here between the nose, you see that strange geometric U-shaped three-sided square. The owl-like eyes. The uh, long, elongated nose is a characteristic. Notice the two long strands of hair hanging down on the forehead. On all four of these images, all four, you see the wisps of hair. Not one strand, but you actually have two strands of hair. All of these markings, all of these congruent points, lead me to believe that something influenced these artists. These similarities are not only found in paintings. This coin was struck in 695 A.D. Uh, we see on the coin a rather crude image here, but as we rotate our filter and, uh, com and go uh, back and forth, we notice there are some remarkable similarities. For instance, if we look on the coin, we notice these large clefts off the side of the face here. But if we go to the shroud, we see exactly the same cleft. On the coin, there's a bridge across uh, right here. We rotate the shroud, we notice the same bridge there. On the coin, there's a little outpouching here. We rotate the shroud, there's the same outpouching right there. As we look at the eyebrows, we see these match up. If we look at this blood stain on the shroud here, we see that it, in the uh, hair here, if we even drop down to the fold on the shroud across the neck, we see that the iconographer who was doing this uh, dive for the coin included this very exactingly. And there's no question who the die cutter thought it was, because here it says, uh, East of Christus uh, Rex Regnatium around here, Jesus Christ, King of Kings. If the shroud is the burial cloth of Jesus, then it began its journey here, where Jesus died. In the modern city of Jerusalem, the past is still alive. Many of the customs still reflect the ancient world. Does the burial of the man on the shroud fit with ancient Jewish culture? American-born rabbi Micha Halpern has lived in Israel for many years. He has made a specialty of first century Jewish life. This is the Via Della Rosa. It's about one mile long. It's the traditional place from which Jesus walked to his crucifixion. And pilgrims come from all over the world and have been coming for centuries to traverse this very path. Anybody want something? $4. Jerusalem at the time was a Jewish city, and as a result, Jesus would have been buried in the context of Jewish law. Shroud scholars believe that the burial of Jesus, though hasty, was performed in accordance with Jewish custom. The Jewish Bible relates that one should remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, on Friday afternoon, people are running and hustling and bustling in order to finish their chores before the Sabbath enters. Um, so too was the case 2,000 years ago. Jesus was taken down from the cross on Friday in order to speedily inter him before the Sabbath day because nothing can be done on Sabbath. No work, only rest. Is there any record of the shroud in the earliest years right after the death of Jesus? According to legend, a king in nearby Edessa fell gravely ill and called for the Jewish healer. Jesus has already died, but a cloth bearing his image is delivered to the king.
King Abgar is immediately healed, and the miraculous cloth becomes known as the Mandilion. The Mandilion is venerated throughout the Middle East as the image of Christ, and the city of Edessa becomes a center for Christianity. Mandilion is a word that means little towel. On this little towel was the face of Jesus painted on a stylized background and usually shown framed. If the Mandilion was the shroud, why did it show only the face? It was then known only as a face cloth, but Ian Wilson, the English historian, says, ah, there's a key word in ancient documents, tetradiplon, which means doubled in four. If you double the shroud in four, you end up with a little rectangle with a face in the middle. Could the cloth of Edessa be the shroud folded to reveal only the face? The shroud is its own best map to the past. You start with one clue and it leads to another. Club volunteers, please. In 1978, the Sturp team discovered a number of folds on the shroud. But of those, eight were prominent. And what we're going to do now is replicate that folding of the shroud. The uh, breaking light photographs proved, yes, there are eight folds in the shroud. Of course, photography can't tell us when they were made, but it does show that at least at one time in its existence, that shroud was folded in eight. So there would have been a rectangle with the face sitting in the middle of the rectangle. In the year 944, the Mandelian was moved to Constantinople, where it was periodically placed on public view. There, in 1203, a French knight from the Fourth Crusade reported seeing the image of Christ's body on a cloth. A year later, the Crusaders sacked the city and carried their spoils to Europe. Here, the record of the Mandelian abruptly ends, and the record of the Shroud begins. This is a cave just outside of Jerusalem, which is probably very similar to the type of cave where Jesus himself was buried. Uh, it would be closed with a large rock, a boulder most probably, and that's how the Christian Bible actually describes the burial of Jesus. When the Sturp team examined the underside of the shroud, they found that some pollen grains could not be identified because they were coated with a mineral. This mineral was subsequently analyzed and traced. And investigating the mineral, they discovered that it was a limestone of sorts. A limestone very, very rare and indigenous to an area outside of Jerusalem. The shroud is uh, covered with blood. So the question would be, why wasn't the body of Jesus um, properly washed the way in which traditional burial uh, requires in Jewish law. So the answer would be that when there's a tremendous amount of bleeding, one doesn't uh, uh, purify the body with water for fear that one would wash off all of that blood. That blood has to be buried with the body itself. We find that even in today's uh, uh, news accounts of uh, the terror attacks in Israel, let's say, for instance, when uh, in the aftermath of those events, you have rabbis and uh, righteous people going around literally sponging up the blood which, uh, of victims, which is on the ground, to be buried appropriately. According to the Christian Bible, there were two cloths found in the tomb, the shroud and another cloth. The second was believed to have covered the face of Jesus just after he was taken down from the cross. Simon Peter saw the cloth lying there on the ground, and also the cloth that had been over his head. This was not with the linen cloth, but rolled up in a place by itself. This cloth, called the Sudarium, is found today in Oviedo in northern Spain. 
Jorge Rodriguez is a member of Spain's Shroud Study Center, and Mark Goosen has written a recent book about the Sudarium and its relationship to the Shroud. The Sudarium is covered with blood, but there is no image as there is on the Shroud. It is believed that this cloth was removed from the face before the body was wrapped in the shroud. The cloth is running away from danger. It was always just ahead of the invaders, just escaping, always going further north to, uh, to the safer places. And this is where it stayed. This was the safest place in Spain during the, the Moorish invasion. It began its journey out of Jerusalem in the year 614 to escape an advancing Persian army. First taken to Alexandria, it was repeatedly moved westward along the African coast until it reached Toledo in Christian Spain. When the Moorish invasion of Spain began in 711, the Sudarium was rushed further north into the mountains and hidden in a cave. Using a replica, researchers show how the cloth was wrapped across the face. They believe it was pressed to the face, absorbing blood and other fluids, consistent with the Jewish custom of respectfully covering the face of a victim of violence, and then preserving the covering to keep the blood with the body. And these stains here are particularly interesting because they coincide exactly with the, with the stains on the, on the back of the shroud, on the dorsal image of the blood again that was caught in the hair from the, from the wounds from the crown of thorns. They're exactly the same here. Recent home video analysis by Dr. Alan Wanger reveals remarkable similarities between the sudarium and the shroud. Uh, shroud face uh, uh, superimposed on that of the sudarium. Uh, blood stains. That's the most marked one, and the one of the easier to reference is this blood stain right here. Dropping down to the area on the nose, as we see uh, congruence down here, and as we shift into the hair here, we can see again uh, congruences of these blood stains. The blood type on the cloth of Oviedo has been found to be type AB. This is the same blood type found on the shroud. We know for a fact that the Sudarium has been in Spain since the 7th century. This in itself undercuts the Shroud's carbon dating by at least 600 years. The Book of Testaments, which is here in the cathedral, uh, takes the Sudarium even further back, and we believe that it takes it all the way back to the 1st century, that it was one of the burial cloths of Christ, or used just before the burial. In 1988, carbon dating tests concluded that the shroud was no more than 600 years old. This seemed to put an end to scientific inquiry into the cloth. Many theories were advanced why the test might be wrong, but few scientists were convinced. Then, microbiologist Dr. Garza Valdez announced a significant discovery a coating he found on ancient cloth fibers caused by bacteria which can distort carbon dating. In 1996, he tested a few fibers of the shroud and found enough of this coating to skew significantly the carbon dating results. Physicist Dr. Harry Gove is the inventor of the modern technique for carbon dating. This um, bacterial contamination is something that the people who did the carbon dating were not aware of. In fact, I don't think anyone was aware of it until Garza Valdez discovered this possibility. Even if they had been aware of it, the cleaning procedure that they used would not have uh, taken care of it. So there was no way that they could have um, made a, a, a absolutely unequivocal date of the, of the shroud material. With the results of the carbon dating now in question, scientists are already at work finding a way to separate the bioplastic coating from the original linen. When the procedure for separating the cellulose from the bioplastic coating is well established, then I think we would be 
prepared to offer to uh, do another um, carbon date on the shroud. Wh whether the offer will be accepted is, is not at all clear. <laughs> With regard to the carbon dating, there is one more factor which, if it occurred, would definitely have thrown off the results. Radiation. If what I am told by physicists is correct, it's a projected image. And in other words, it's almost as though the body were floating in the middle of the cloth and all of the projection comes off at right angles to the body. This image is directly collimated from the body. That is, it's parallel and parallel to gravity. This is so unique that it has to be explained as a radiation phenomena. And as we rotate back Radiation may be the only way to explain recent findings that the image is like an x-ray, revealing internal structures of the body. Uh, we are seeing the, the bones, the metacarpals, uh, here. Even more striking, as we shift up to the wrist area and rotate back and forth, looking here, we can identify the individual wrist bones on the shrouded turin. We see skeletal features in the depth of the body consistent with some type of x-radiation. And so we feel that the image, other than the direct contact with it from blood and so forth, is basically a, a formed by uh, this a remarkable and unique situation of radiation. Superimposing a skull over the face of the shroud reveals internal structures with remarkable clarity. Uh, we can see that we are seeing the images of teeth here. As we shift back and forth, we can see on the shroud, here are the teeth, roots and all, uh, and what is the source of the radiation? Some researchers feel they have the answer to that one, too. I believe this image is on the cloth because of the transformation that occurred during the resurrection. The body transferred from one medium to another, and in so doing, it left a recoil. And it's just such a recoil of particles radiating from the body that marked the image on the shroud. That's why we get the three-dimensional effect and other things. What does that? I don't know. Let alone, how do you get that kind of energy out of a corpse? We will never know if the image on the cloth is Jesus. The fascination itself, though, with the cloth is that it links us, everyone, to um, a death, the death of uh, a person. This shroud is symbolic of the big issues of life after death. Is there a world afterwards? What is the meaning of the shroud? I don't think it's essential to anyone's faith. But in that same chapter 20 of the Gospel of John that describes its discovery in the empty tomb, we also have the story of the doubting Thomas. I think there's still a lot of folk around in the 20th century whose spiritual birth certificates are from Missouri. You've got to show me. What kept my attention over all these years is the sheer mystery of it. I feel that there are clues on the shroud that have not been revealed yet, have not been made evident and clear to people that will tell the story of the shroud and how it came to be. I knew people were going to ask me whether I had any great religious experiences or anything like that. So I sat down about three o'clock in the morning and very quiet, there weren't anybody around, and looked at the shroud and said, okay, how do you feel? What do you feel? Uh, no, I had no great religious experience. Uh, I didn't, uh, you know. But the one thing that kept really sinking into my mind was looking at the face as opposed to the body. The face has a very serene, peaceful look. And the body is terribly beat up. Uh, the two just don't go together. Our team spent hundreds of thousands of hours. And after that period of time, remembering that our primary goal was to go and determine how the image was formed, came back with nothing. <laughs>
could not answer that question. So in essence, we can tell you what it's not, but we cannot tell you what it is. Theology should not be in conflict with technology. Reason can never prove the divinity of Christ. Science can't make a theological statement. At best, it can say, this probably wrapped the historical Jesus of Nazareth. But the question that theology asked is, who do you say that I am? No scientific laboratory can answer that one. It's still up to the individual to review the evidence and decide for him or herself just what the Shroud of Turin really is. The Shroud of Turin has made a greater impression on my life than anything else. Uh, it's kept my total attention for over 20 years. Uh, I'm not uh, through with it at this time. Uh, I expect that it will be the major focus of my attention the rest of my life. <laughs>